Leon started us off by uh, referring to that letter that, um, that Adam Smith wrote to Lord Shelburne, where Smith said, um, this was from the 27th of January in 1768. Smith said, I have not, however, made all the progress that I had expected. Well, um, so we dedicated the auditorium here, the Adam Smith Auditorium, sort of in the spirit of not making as much progress as we would have expected. Um, so going from uh, Deirdre to Sam to me, I think we might see we are not making as much progress as we had hoped. We're going perhaps in the wrong direction. Uh, but I also noted, I took another look at that letter. I hadn't uh, remembered what was in that letter, but Smith also wrote, so it was to Lord Shelburne. Um, and Smith had uh, spent some time with Lord Shelburne in London, uh, so the Lord uh, Shelburne hosted him, and Smith wrote, I want to quote him, thank you for the regard with which you have been so good as to honor me. There is nothing your lordship could possibly have done that would have bound me more effectually to you. So I have the same sentiments to Leon and Sandy and the rest of the organizing community, uh, the organizers of this excellent event, and I would like to say thank you for allowing me to be part of it. So the, talk, uh, the title of my talk is Adam Smith's Libertarian Paternalism, um, which I suppose risks alienating both the people, the group of people who want to claim Smith for the left and those who want to claim him for the right, uh, which is uh, not altogether a typical position for me where I'll end up with nobody agreeing with me. Uh, so we'll see. And this is part of a larger project, so I'm only going to give parts in the interest of time. We don't have a lot of time this morning, so I hope that this can be at least coherent what I present this morning, but it is part of a larger project. So in their influential book, Nudge, this was a 2009 book um, by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, they argue for what they call libertarian paternalism, which they define as the strategy to devise policy that will maintain or increase freedom of choice, that's the libertarian part, and at the same time will influence people's behavior in order to make their lives longer, healthier, and better, that's the paternalistic part. Their goal is to help people to make, to make the decisions they would have made, quote, if they had paid full attention, possessed complete information, unlimited cognitive abilities, and complete self-control. So if they paid full attention, they possessed complete information, possessed unlimited cognitive abilities, and complete self-control. That might seem like a high standard, uh, but they insist that their intention is only, quote, to influence choices in a way that will make choosers better off as judged by themselves. In other words, as judged by the choosers themselves. Um, so the desire to, the two desires, to allow people freedom of choice on the one hand and uh, to help them make better choices on the other, often conflict. And striking the right balance between policies designed to encourage the former or the latter has proved, I think, difficult in both theory and practice. So what I'd like to suggest this morning, um, in my talk this morning, is um, how I think Adam Smith might contribute to that conversation. Smith didn't explicitly develop a theory of freedom, but nevertheless, I think we can re reconstruct a conception of political freedom and a conception of what it means to be a free person by working backward, as it were, from some of the specific claims he makes about moral agency and from some of his policy rec uh, recommendations. So what I'd like to suggest is that Smith developed his own version of what we might call libertarian paternalism. It differs in important ways from the Thaler and Sunstein version. Um, but it shares with their version an attempt to balance respect for individual autonomy with a desire to help people lead better lives. So I'll suggest that Smith did acknowledge the important role of a kind of paternalism in helping people make better choices, while at the same time his sensitivity to the importance of free choice for developing good judgment led him also to recommend a robust role for individual autonomy. So Smith's position ends up accommodating the importance both of both liberty and paternalism in enabling individuals to construct lives worth living, or so I'll argue. So let me get to my, my argument. Smith claims in the theory of moral sentiments that one of his four central virtues is self-command, and I must say that um, one of the disadvantages of going on the second day of a conference is that um, I heard a lot of people say, talk about some of these things already, and I should have incorporated these into my talk, but alas. So one of his four central virtues is self-command. In fact, that's, uh, he claims that self-command is what gives the other central virtues, the other central virtues being prudence, justice, and what he calls proper beneficence, their principal luster. But what's required for self-command to be a virtue? That is a first pass, I think it seems to require that one have an ability to separate oneself both from one's own passions and from the influences of others around one. 
and then to direct one's judgments and actions with both deliberation and conscious intentionality. Now, Smith had argued that the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments is one of our strongest social desires. It's when we discover that others enter into or sympathize with our own sentiments that we experience the pleasure of mutual sympathy. And because the achievement of sympathy, uh, of sympathy of sentiments is, is pleasurable to us, that gives us incentive to judge or behave in ways that generate this mutual sympathy. By contrast, when we realize that others do not enter into our sentiments, we experience the displeasure of an antipathy of sentiments, which encourages us to revise our judgments or our behavior. The result is a mutual drive towards <clears throat> shared expectations about one another's behavior, a process that over time gives rise to a shared set of standards about morality. Self-command is a virtue for Smith because it enables us to constrain our judgments so that they accord not only with what we might like, but also with what others expect of us and with what comes to constitute praiseworthy behavior. Now, of course, Smith's full argument is more complicated than that. In particular, it involves the creation of the perspective of an impartial spectator, which um, Sam yesterday explicated very well. According to Smith, people are born with no morality whatsoever. A baby knows only its own wants, he says. The baby has no notion of a proper or improper thing to ask for, a proper or improper way to ask for it, or of embarrassment for having asked for something that it should not have asked for. So the baby attempts to have its wants satisfied simply by alarming its caregiver with howls and cries, Smith says. But we don't blame the baby for this self-indulgence because it's not yet capable of considering propriety or considering others' interests. And besides, uh, Smith says it's probably, the baby's probably encouraged in its self-centeredness by its indulgent parent or nurse. So according to Smith, it's not until the baby's grown to a child and begins to play with its mates that it has the jolting experience of, re of realizing that it is not the center of everyone's life, only of its own. Smith writes that this is the child's introduction into the great school of self-command. It's on being with others and experiencing them judging oneself, even if only implicitly by, say, not playing with one or simply ignoring one's demands. Um, it's that experience um, that leads to the displeasure associated with an antipathy of sentiments. After that initial jolt, the child casts about for a way to relieve the displeasure, eventually hitting upon using her self-command to modify her sentiments and behavior so that they more closely match those of her playmates. At that point, an exquisite new pleasure is experienced, that of the mutual sympathy of sentiments, and a new and permanent, Smith thinks, desire for this pleasure has been aroused. So it's the experience of being judged that thus triggers in the child what Smith calls an original desire to please and an original aversion to offend his brethren. From that point on, according to Smith, the child regularly engages in trial and error investigation into what behaviors will achieve this sympathy and thus satisfy that desire. So these trial and error attempts lead us to adopt habits and then rules of behavior that increase the chance of achieving mutual sympathy. By the time we've grown to adulthood, we have adopted a wide range of principles of behavior and judgment that we can apply in many different situations. And since everyone else is engaging in precisely the same investigation, all of our disparate attempts lead us to gravitate, uh, tend to gravitate towards mutually acceptable means. This is the, what I think anyway, the invisible hand mechanism that Smith thinks generates commonly shared standards of behavior and judgment, indeed, a commonly shared system of morality. But this raises a question, more than one question, but at least this question. Why should we care what others, um, let alone an imaginary observer, thinks of our conduct? Why should we care about that? Well, for a few reasons, Smith thinks. First of all, because your habit of doing so is so deeply ingrained in you already that if you don't heed your conscience, you will be unhappy. So I think this is Smith's answer to the Ring of Gyges problem from book two of Plato's Republic. Um, there we hear the story of a young shepherd. You may know this story, the young shepherd who discovers a ring with magical powers of making him invisible. Um, and as one does, when one discovers a ring that makes you invisible, um, you uh, seduce the queen, uh, you conspire with the king, the queen to kill the king, and you install yourself on the throne. 
the lesson of the story, according to Glaucon, Glaucon's the person who tells it in the Republic, Glaucon says, the lesson of that story is that, quote, one is never just willingly, but only when compelled to be. So Socrates uh, commences after that a long, a lengthy response to this. Um, in fact, in some ways, the entire rest of the Republic is effectively a response to that, uh, that challenge. Uh, but he argues ultimately that the life of injustice is not, in fact, desirable, uh, more desirable than the life of justice. Um, so how does this relate to Adam Smith? Well, for Smith's part, I, um, Smith claims that man desires not only to be praised, but has a further desire of being what he himself approves of in other men. So I think that for Smith, this further desire results itself from the continued workings of the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments. Smith says that all of us have at some time been frustrated or chagrined when people disapproved of our conduct because we believe they did not fully understand the circumstances involved. And only partial familiarity with another situation might well bias or prejudice the judgment of others. And all of us have experienced the unpleasantness of being on the wrong end of a biased or prejudiced or partly uninformed or even completely misinformed judgment. So Smith's argument is that the un that unpleasant experiences like these encourage us in such circumstances to repair not to the judgment of actual observers, but instead to the judgment of an imaginary, informed, and disinterested observer. Smith calls this observer the impartial spectator, and he believes that this standard arises unintentionally as a result, on the one hand, of individuals wanting mutual sympathy of sentiments, and on the other, their frequent frustration at others' inability or unwillingness to expend the effort necessary to understand another's full situation before passing judgment on them. When mutual sympathy is not forthcoming from actual and often partial spectators, we may find solace in an imagined impartial spectator who, because of this impartiality, would, or at least might, approve of our conduct. So the, though the perspective of the imagined spectator is constructed through our own experiences and is hence itself liable to various partialities and biases, Smith argues that his judgment will more closely approximate an idealized standard because it will be informed by our realizations that more accurate judgments ensue from fully informed but disinterested observers. So our desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments then expands to include and can be satisfied, according to Smith, um, by a sympathy achieved with such an imagined, idealized observer. We are thus naturally led to consult this imaginary observer, and over time the practice of doing so becomes so habitual that we will as often consult this imagined impartial spectator um, as we will the sentiments of actual spark, uh, spectators. So I think that gives us an answer to, uh, uh, Smith's answer to Plato's Ring of Gyges problem, even if, according to Smith, even if we were guaranteed that no actual person would discover our misconduct, we would still be unable to avoid the damning judgment of our own conscience. That is our own imagined impartial spectator. The force of habit means that this impartial spectator's judgment often incurs to us un even unwittingly, and in such case it would um, inform us that our misconduct is such that we ourselves would condemn it in another person. That realization is sufficient to trigger the antipathy and thus the displeasure of a failure of an imagined mutual sympathy of sentiments. So for Smith, the reasons to follow our communities, one's community's rules of morality would include, first, the anticipated pleasure resulting from a mutual sympathy of sentiments with actual spectators who might approve of our conduct. Second, the pleasure resulting from a sympathy of sentiments with an imagined spectator who might approve of our conduct. But also, third, the fear of an anticipated displeasure resulting from the judgment of other actual spectators who might discover one's misdeeds, and then fourth, the displeasure resulting from an antipathy of sentiments with the imagined impartial spectator um, who would know of our misdeeds. So these conspire, according to Smith, to provide a powerful incentive to follow the rules of conduct that one approves in others, and not to follow rules of conduct that one disapproves in others, and all of them, I would like to suggest, arise from paternalistic nudges that we receive from others about how we ought to behave. So let me explain that just a little bit more. Although we can, on Smith's account, distance ourselves from others' expectations of us, one thing we cannot distance ourselves from is the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments. Now this may perhaps seem like a liability, but it's actually a crucial part of Smith's account. 
One reason that Smith can be optimistic about the development of relatively beneficial decentralized social orders is precisely because he believes that we all feel the pull of the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments. This is the beginning of Smith's libertarian paternalism. The self-command that Smith extols comprises two main things. The first is a strong natural pull toward compliance with others' expectations. It's a kind of centripetal social force, and this is a good thing. Because a chief component of happiness is loving relations with other people, Smith says, quoting Smith, the chief part of happiness arises from the consciousness of being beloved. Because of that, each of us has to figure out how to establish and maintain such relationships. That means that we will have to moderate our behavior so that it falls within, within what others find to be acceptable parameters. But this gives us reason to seek out companionship with others, but more than that, it encourages us to coordinate our behaviors, our beliefs, our, even our tastes with those others who matter to us. Their expectations become then paternalistic nudges for us. And as naturally social creatures, I guess we're naturally social creatures, most of us anyway, um, as naturally social creatures, um, <clears throat> we face a kind of hypothetical imperative. If I want to be happy, I need to accommodate myself to others' expectations. And we apply nudges like that to others, rewarding and punishing their behaviors, as the case may be, even when others do not understand why we do so or would prefer we be, um, to behave differently from the way we are encouraging. But what constitutes, and here I think is part of the key of Smith's argument, what constitutes appropriate accommodations of other people's nudges that any of us should make can fall only within reasonable parameters. And, crucially for Smith, we always retain the ability, and in some cases I think even the duty, as when the impartial spectator requires it, to break from other people's expectations. This is the second part of Smith's conception of self-command. The desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments means that the default is to comport with others' expectations, and our ability to exercise self-command indicates our relative ability to do so, yet as adults, we can also choose when not to comply with others' expectations. This is Smith's psychological, moral, and perhaps even political libertarianism. Now, knowing when, not to, uh, when to comply and when to defect is not easy. It's a function of good judgment, which Smith, following Aristotle, believes is a skill that must be practiced to be effective. But practice isn't enough. We also have to have feedback, and this feedback has to have some purchase on us. That is precisely the role that the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments plays. When others do not enter into our sentiments, it generates a displeasure in us. We can't escape that. But what we can do is select those opportune moments when the displeasure is worth it. When that is some other good, perhaps compliance with the imagined impartial spectator, outweighs the cost of failing to achieve mutual sympathy of sentiments with actual spectators. So every morally mature person of good judgment deliberately distances herself from potential instances of mutual sympathy of sentiments at various times in her life. It's often difficult to know when we should do so, and we often get it wrong, but we possess the ability to choose to depart from others' expectations, and virtue will require, will require that we do so on many occasions throughout our lives. Hence, the picture that are, of human freedom that I think emerges for Smith is one of libertarian paternalism, both at the individual level and perhaps at the political level. At the individual level, the behavioral principles framed from others' expectations of us result from their nudges, and the overt recommendations we make to people to follow those principles are part of the paternalistic aspect of human sociality. Our default of following the nudges is thus a proper response to that paternalistic impulse. Yet, those occasions when we demur are instances of our freedom to follow separate and different paths. But Smith's libertarian paternalism applies, I think, at the political level as well. Smith's survey of historical and empirical evidence leads him to conclude in The Wealth of Nations that those societies that allow labor to divide and allow people to enjoy the rewards or bear the costs, as the case may be, of their activities are the ones in which prosperity increases and in which what he calls a universal opulence and general plenty ensue. He concludes that a government should do only a few things, enforce justice, both against um, foreign and domestic aggression, and provide a few public works that both provide uh, benefit to the nation as a whole and cannot be provided by private enterprise. 
Um, one small note about that, Smith's category of public works seems pretty small. Um, he suggests it's only a few things, mainly infrastructure that facilitates commerce as well as partially subsidized, locally controlled primary schooling. Um, but what about all the other things that are required for a fully virtuous life? Smith worried in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, for example, about the deleterious effects that extreme division of labor could have on the minds of laborers. In uh, Smith's understated way, he says, it could render them as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. And he suggests that every citizen should learn to read, write, and do basic arithmetic and perhaps a little geometry as a partial remedy of that. But in the theory of moral sentiment, Smith speaks at length about the various aspects of beneficence, that is positive actions that one should take on others' behalf that are required to be fully virtuous. So if the state were to take no cognizance of such matters, how can we be sure people will be able to develop into virtuous creatures? The Smithian answer is the libertarian paternalism that underlies his conception of the moral marketplace. The state may be discharged from superintending the beneficent action in which people should, actions in which people should engage, not only because he believes it's not competent to do so, such matters can't be determined in the abstract or from afar, so dependent are they on the local details of particular situations, but also because people's natural desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments will already do the job as well as could be hoped. So the patterns of localized moral ju judgment become then like prices. They convey information about people's expectations, their tolerances, their willingness to go along with novelty and so on. And uh, these, the, this information is responsive to people's particular circumstances and exploit people's local knowledge of those circumstances in a way that no distant third party or perhaps no legislator, however intelligent or well-intended, could possibly do. So what I'm calling Smith's libertarian paternalism parallels and I think relies in part on the sharp distinction Smith draws in the theory of moral sentiments between justice and beneficence assume this distinction will be familiar to most of you, Smith says that because the mere want of beneficence tends to do no real positive evil, it follows, two, at least two things follow. First, beneficence therefore cannot be extorted by force, and two, the mere want of it exposes to no punishment. So according to Smith, acting with justice leaves you, um, toward you, leaves you no worse off than you already were, though it may not by itself leave you any better off, and for this reason, Smith calls it a negative virtue. He claims that we may often, famously, we may often um, fulfill all the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. So I think everybody here today is fulfilling the rules of justice towards one another. Congratulations. But by sitting still and doing nothing, that's not acting with positive virtue. Um, in other words, not generating any improvement in anybody's situation. But Smith contends, quote, still he does no positive hurt to anybody. So failing in proper beneficence, which for Smith includes things like charity, compassion, generosity, what he calls humanity, might give us reason to disapprove of and be reasonably disappointed by another's behavior, but it does not license coercive punishment like jailing or fines. If I don't do you the good office you hoped or expected that I would, you may be disappointed and even justifiably disappointed, but you are no worse off than you were before. Because I've done you no real positive hurt, meaning that I have not worsened your ex ante position, you may not take positive action to punish me. By contrast, if I fail to act with justice toward you, that means I did do real positive hurt to you, and uh, leaving you worse off uh, than you were before. And that does give rise to justified resentment, which, according to Smith, lices, licenses punishment. So um, paternalistic nudging, then, to engage in beneficent action is crucial, but according to Smith, must be left in the realm of private and not state action. Okay. So this, I think, allows us to see how Smith's version of libertarian paternalism contrasts with that of uh, the libertarian paternalism of a more recent vintage, namely that of Thaler and Sunstein. In both cases, we see recommendations about what behaviors to engage in or to avoid based on a kind of hypothetical imperative for Smith, it's the hypothetical imperative deriving from the desire for leading a happy life. Um, for Thaler and Sunstein, it's more like leading a healthy life, uh, maybe also a kind of docile life, um, but certainly healthy. And in both cases, we see the desire to satisfy the twin goals of enabling free choice and also encouraging and enabling people to make better choices. 
Yet there are several important differences between the two accounts. First, Smith's argument that justice, as he understands it, is both necessary and sufficient for society to subsist means that whatever paternalistic nudging we might think uh, will help people make good decisions must be pursued within the realm of localized social relations. It must be, they must be tailored to individuals' localized uh, circumstances, and they must be pursued only after the observance of the rules of justice. So I think there's a lexical priority there for Smith. Justice first, beneficence only thereafter. And um, no amount of beneficence is going to make up for a, um, injustice uh, beforehand. Second difference, Smith's argument that whereas justice is relatively easy to administrate centrally, while beneficence, uh, here in potentially including paternalism, is much more difficult, means that on Smith's account, paternalism must be decentralized and local if it's to be effective. And third, and finally, Smith's argument that effective beneficence requires extensive knowledge of and must be adapted to people's individual circumstances means that beneficence, and even paternalism, will likely fail if it proceeds from centralized or, uh, and general laws or regulations. Okay, so let me come to my conclusion in the interest of time. Um, let me conclude by considering a potential objection to my interpreter, my presentation of Smith. Um, one might wonder whether Smithian libertarian paternalism, as I presented it, counts as properly paternalistic at all. Most contemporary accounts of paternalism include some measure of coercion, either directly by requiring compliance with a set of policies or behaviors regardless of an individual's wish, or indirectly by imposing benefits on favored and costs on disfavored activities or behaviors, again, regardless of individual's desires. But if Smith has ruled out state action for beneficent purposes and relegated nudging to the realms of private relations and associations among individuals, then to what extent is his position truly paternalistic? Well, I think Smith would not have an objection to private persons and private enterprises or private associations um, adopting a deliberate choice architecture strategy. And indeed, he might even recommend that they do so on the grounds that their localized knowledge combined with their localized feedback can be an important part of the process of encouraging their associates to develop both good judgment and good behavior. So I teach at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, and it engages in paternalistic libertarianism. Uh, when I uh, first started my job there, there was a whole set of benefits that, um, that I had to approve and they all had default settings. So the amount of my pre-tax income that would be automatically contributed to the, uh, to the retirement benefit, it's all set. Now I can change it, if I, that's the paternalistic part. They've set it for me at very high levels of savings um, in case I don't properly understand uh, how much I should save for my own retirement. Um, I can change it if I wish, but it requires a lot of clicking and figuring out what to do, and so for the most part, you just accept whatever the default is. I think Smith would not uh, object to private enterprises or private firms um, engaging in exactly that kind of behavior. And at the same time, Smith believes that withholding mutual sympathy of sentiments is itself the imposition of a cost. Since each of us naturally desires this mutual sympathy, if others choose not to approve of my conduct, this counts then as a paternalistic punishment because I do in fact desire their approval and experience the lack of it as a displeasure, as a cost. So Smith's argument suggests, I think, that the Thaler and Sunstein program, to that extent, um, is workable, but that it might overreach when it takes the important insight that sometimes others can help us make better decisions for ourselves and transfers that responsibility to distant government agents. Because the relative success of nudges is dependent on the details of particular situations, the level at which the nudges apply matters. So I think the Smithian position would seem to call for a decentralized federalism, allowing and encouraging the greatest scope of independent paternalism at the most local levels, with less and less paternalism as the levels of decision-making ascends from private individuals or groups or firms to municipalities, to states, and then to the federal government. So on Smith's account, proper paternalistic recommendations arise decentrally from the experiences and expectations of people's actual lives and interactions. 
As in the case of the social planner attempting to set prices or allocate resources centrally, Smith would argue that legislators or regulators are typically not in a position that would allow them to exploit people's localized knowledge of crucial, relevant details about their lives, their unique circumstances, their associations, relationships, their opportunities, schedules of value, hierarchies of purpose, and so on. And thus, the paternalistic nudges of centralized legislators would like those of the central economic planner, likely fail to comport with what would actually conduce to people's well-being. The Smithian libertarian paternalism, unlike the Thaler and Sunstein version, would exploit people's knowledge, local knowledge, and respond to people's local lived experience. Now, Smith's, ver Smith's version would also have what I think he thinks is the additional benefit of allowing no centralized group of persons to assume the authority of directing the lives of others about whose circumstances they don't know very much. In a famous passage that we've had a couple of occasions to talk about, you remember the man of system passage? The man of system in the theory of moral sentiments is the person, uh, according to Smith, who overestimates his knowledge of others, of other situations, and thus overestimates his ability to actually benefit others. Um, I expect people were already familiar with that passage before they got here, and certainly after yesterday we are now by now familiar with it, so I won't read the passage. Um, but what I believe is crucial to see about that is that Smith's criticism of the man of system is directed at centralized legislators. It's not directed at local fellow citizens. And that's a distinction that Smith himself recognizes elsewhere when he allows that a local civil magistrate may, after all, quote, I'll quote him, um, civil magistrate may prescribe rules which not only prohibit mutual injuries among fellow citizens, but command mutual good offices to a certain degree. Now, if you remember that passage, I won't go through the rest of that passage, he's very nervous about that. Only to a certain degree, it's extremely difficult, it requires very careful judgment, and you really have to pay attention to the localized circumstances, but he does allow for this to be the case. What I think is crucial here is to see that this is applied at the local level. What he's talking about is that this kind of um, civil magistrate commanding mutual good offices is at the local level. That's what a magistrate is. It's a local person, local authority. He's not talking there about the centralized authority. Um, so Smith rails, in fact, against the er what he calls the arrogance of the most dangerous prince who believes himself competent to organize all of society according to his ideal plan of government and then by extension, who believes himself competent to design and implement beneficial nudges from his centralized Olympian perch. Um, yeah, Smith does recognize the potential for local communities to organize themselves in mutually beneficial and um, mutually uh, beneficial ways using even paternalistic means. So Smith's conception of political freedom and human agency thus, I think, incorporates a robust notion of political and economic community by protecting justice and giving people a strong incentive to associate beneficially with others. And at the same time, it allows the generation and application of robust moral communities, complete with moral agents who feel the pull of, desi of the desire for mutual sympathy of sentiments, but yet retain the ability to make independent decisions. Smith writes, a moral being is an accountable being favorite sentences from the theory of moral sentiments. A moral being is an accountable being. That means that Smith's moral agents assume both a responsibility for themselves and an accountability to others, which just is, I think, his libertarian paternalism. Thank you very much. Thank you.